So have you noticed how our perception of age changes um, as we get older? My mom turned 33 shortly after I was born, which made her an older mom uh, compared to the mothers of my friends. Contrast that to when I had children, I was even two years older than that, uh, when my first child was born and their friends' parents were about the same age as me. While I thought of my mom as older, my kids tell us that they see us as youthful. It's fascinating to me that our kids' perception of age is so different from mine at their ages. Now at 57, I don't think of myself as old, but I hope to grow very old. And one might say my genes increase my chances of success. My grandmother on my mother's side um, lived to be 91, and her mom was in her mid-90s when she passed. My grandmother was the only grandparent I knew, besides the great-grandmother, um, and she was a very important person in my life. Despite her lack of education, she was an incredible role model. She wasn't a Unitarian Universalist, but she lived our values of inclusion, responsibility to care for the earth, and valuing the inherent worth and dignity of others. She was widows, widowed in her early 50s, at which time she earned a GED so that she could work in the billing department at Dornbecker Children's Hospital. She had a very keen sense of managing her own finances and was able to purchase, over time, rental properties um, to supplement her income. This paved the way to support herself through a long retirement. I loved how Grandma's door was always open. We rarely knocked, and she was always happy to see us. And as with most grandmothers, um, there was always food and treats uh, for the asking. The most wonderful treats came from her garden, which she worked year after year until she was 90. That garden was somewhere between a quarter of an acre and a third of an acre, and it brought her so much joy. She grew all kinds of veggies, beans, corn, sunflowers, irises, fruit, you name it, she grew it. And a visit to Grandma's house always meant a trip down to her garden. And all of us kids and our parents uh, loved just munching on the fresh crop right from the source. That garden and the rental properties gave Grandma a strong sense of purpose. It's that one thing that we hear a lot of elderly people lose when they become housebound or don't have hobbies or a social network. She didn't have a travel, travel bug, but she had a little cabin near Mount Hood where she loved to get away. And I have so many wonderful memories uh, from times that we got to be there with her. Um, and those memories were a big driver for us to be able to have our own cabin. For Grandma, though, that cabin was yet another space to putter rather than someplace to just sit and relax. Being active and busy was very important to her. And I also think she loved the independence the cabin represented, and I hope she felt the reward of having built that independence on her own. As you may imagine, my grandmother was a spunky woman. I used to refer to her as a little fireball. She was physically small. She was not even five feet tall and had this wonderful combination of being someone you did not cross, but who also had this incredibly contagious laugh. And um, I sometimes hear it when my son laughs. When Grandma was in her 70s, we were all really happy for her to share that spunk uh, when she remarried. She married a man um, that she and my grandfather had known many, many years prior. Um, when they had adjacent farms in Estacada. She and her new husband had nearly 20 very sweet years together, um, time they spent puttering together in the yard and working on their houses. So thinking about Grandma and considering my own future as an elderly person, I hope to follow her example, doing the things that make me happy and feel alive things like traveling and adventuring outdoors, 
to be able to stay active, both physically and socially. Um, I intend to keep up my exercise routine in order to be strong and mobile and ready to handle um, you know, whatever life is going to bring at me. Um, of course, we don't know what the future holds, so the key is to live each day fully, hopefully into my 90s. Last Sunday, Reverend Marsha read a poem written by a woman about what she plans to do when she grows old. Now let's hear from the perspective of a man. When I am an old man, I will wear plaid trousers. <laughs> let, my shirt let my shirt tail hang out on one side on Tuesdays and wear ties that clash with everything. <laughs> I'll carry a cane whether I need to or not. I want to waggle it at people who ask stupid questions. I won't smile on Thursdays, even if I'm chuckling inside. I'll never be angry on Sundays, except in months where the sun doesn't shine. Maybe I'll shave, maybe I won't. Depends on which eye I open first in the morning. I'll spit in public places, but not on people's shoes, unless they deserve it. I will belch from both ends when the spirit moves me. I'll eat tacos for breakfast, ice cream with salad, drink tea with honey, coffee with maple syrup, and rum with nothing at all. <laughs> I'll stare everyone straight in the sky, give my opinion on everything under the sun, sun if I'm asked, and especially if I'm not. <laughs> I'll speak to God direct, help him out when he needs it, but gently, because mainly he does good work when people leave him alone, that is. I'll cry at movies and funerals, laugh at my own mistakes if I make any, hug my sons and my daughters every chance I get, raise my hat to any woman wearing purple. I think I'll have more fun saying what I think, being who I am, staring at the stars when I am an old man wearing plaid trousers. I have to say my own father wore plaid trousers. <laughs> especially when he played golf, which was often. When we are young, adults often ask us what we want to be when we grow up. If you had asked me that question when I was 11 years old, I would have told you that I wanted to be a veterinarian and I wanted to marry Ringo Starr. <laughs> and if you think back on it, each of us has spent many, many hours thinking about our future, dreaming, planning, hoping, and worrying. And over the course of our lives, those dreams and plans and hopes and worries have changed. Since I was in the 20s, no one has asked me what I want to do with my life. But I find that as I enter the seventh decade of my life, I'm asking myself that question. So Joyce, what do you want to do when you grow old? Predictably, my answer no longer includes Ringo Starr or veterinary medicine. <laughs> Aging happens to all of us. There's no way to stop it. When we arrive at a point in our lives where our children are adults and they're on their own to some extent, and we are retiring or we're retired, in other words, no longer producing products or services for the larger world and making money, there are deep and often painful questions to be considered whether we wish to consider them or not. This is a time when our bodies and our minds, which we used to be able to depend on to work in a certain way, no longer work as efficiently and seamlessly as they once did. That loss of control is frustrating and it's scary, but it goes deeper. How do we reconcile this reality with our sense of ourselves that we've had for pretty much our entire adult life? We deal with loss, loss of friends, the very deep loss of a spouse or life partner. Some of us lose a child. And we find ourselves taking stock, reviewing, analyzing the successes and the failures that make up not the whole story, but a portion of our story. The answers that we reach may cause a profound change in our outlook. There are so many questions that we are invited to think about. And I say invited because some of us are going to decline that invitation.
for those of us who accept the invitation, there are a lot of really important questions to address. Have I lived my life the way I wanted to, the way I ought to? What can I do now, given the, strength, the, the constraints of my health and my age? Are there things that are left undone or unsaid that I need to tend to? Are there new experiences that I want to have? What do I regret? What do I hope will live on through my children, my grandchildren, or students, and others whose lives I have encountered? I've noticed that our society has developed terms for various stages of our lives. Infant, toddler, youth, teenager, adult. We even have a category called tween. But once we are classified as an adult, the stages don't continue to develop, it seems. What do we call an adult who is in this late stage of life, but still very much alive? Calling us adults is too general and it doesn't acknowledge the different set of challenges that we are facing at this time in our lives. So for me, it's time to do a deep dive into what this period of getting older means to me. And since society doesn't offer me a clear path, I have to create one for myself. I have to create a meaning and perhaps even a title to describe what I'm experiencing as an older adult. So I've been thinking, and I like the noun elder, and I like the verb eldering. Um, the role of the elder, elder, like so much else, has gotten lost in modern American society. It feels like there is no clear path to eldering. So I had to look elsewhere for guidance. Once again, indigenous cultures have very specific roles to be played by the elders. The elders teach the traditional knowledge and the practices. There are councils of elders who share their collective wisdom. Indigenous societies can serve as models for us about how elders can be valued and useful in our own society. We lack that kind of structural validation in American society. But if anyone asks me what I want to do now, I will tell them that I want to elder this feels more intentional than just aging, uh, and it feels like more fun. So as I've been thinking of positive ways of eldering, I ran across, across information about the Vedic age that flourished in India between 1500 and 600 BC. You'll get why I mentioned this in a moment. Vedic literature formed the basis of Hinduism. The philosophers and writers of that ancient society told their followers that every stage of life has a particular role, both practical and spiritual. And here's the piece that stood out for me. The Vedic writers laid out a system of four stages of life, or ashrama. For the sake of transparency, I will note that these stages only applied to wealthy men. Where you use, we're not going to go down that path. So the language of the teaching will be all inclusive. In stage one, the students studied with a guru to acquire the knowledge and values of their people. And the student learned all that he, she, or they needed to know to become a householder. Stage two was when the person became a householder. And the person was expected to rise in their profession, be visible in their community, produce children, worship the gods, enjoy sex, gain wealth, because householders had to support themselves and their family members as those family members traveled through the first stage. Stage three would start when the last child became a householder. In this stage, the person and their spouse, if they so chose, could begin to let go of worldly goods, could become a forest dweller, take time to reflect on what had been, perhaps study matters that they had no time for previously. The forest dweller's spiritual and physical task was to downsize, turn inward, and make sense of it all. I find that somewhat 
eerie and fabulous that in 1000 BC, they developed an understanding of the spiritual stages of a person's life and that it was closely mirror, mirroring what I'm going through right now in 2023. That says to me that there's a, a universality to this eldering experience and it crosses both time and cultural lines. I've already downsized and I find that I'm very drawn to turning inward and to trying to make sense of my life. I will briefly mention the fourth Vedic stage because it relates to the Hindu belief in reincarnation, but I'm gonna set that aside. That's not something I'm planning on. If it happens, great, but for right now, I'd like to really focus on stage three. <laughs> the first three stages apply in many ways to our modern American culture. The main difference is that many of us don't intentionally engage in the third one, the forest dweller eldering phase. I'm gonna put that on my front door. Forest dweller lives here. We could apply that. We could view eldering as a new and even a welcome set of tasks and focus that are beautifully suited to our aging bodies and our precious minds that are so filled with education and experience and joys and laughter and sadness and memories and everything else that in, is in those minds. The eldering forest dweller stage is our time to do the things that we didn't or couldn't take time to do when we were busy, busy, busy householders. It's also our time to examine and evaluate how we've lived, what we've learned, and what we still want to learn, to celebrate what we have, as well as to grieve the unavoidable endings that we have experienced and will experience. One of the things I really do regret is that I didn't ask more questions of my elders. They're gone, they're gone now, and the questions are unanswered. And I just have to wonder, what were they most proud of in their life, in their work, in their family? What do they wish they had done differently? Did they believe in God? I don't even know if my own parents believed in God. We never discussed it, how sad. If they didn't believe in God, what did they believe? Aging is hard. I'm not ignoring the many, many challenges that each of us face. But the choices that we make now about to handle each of these changes may, de may determine whether we thrive or wither. wither. Our religious community can offer us an important anchor as we enter the forest of the elders. It can support our spirit while we ask and think through the various questions that are coming up about who we are, who have we been, and who will we become? And the equally important questions about the divine and end of life experiences that we're going to face. Aging may be unavoidable, but eldering can be purposeful. And I think of all of us at every stage and every age being able to gain from focusing on how we can integrate eldering into our lives. The good news is that elders are not an endangered species. They are right here among us, here in this room. I see an elder who is knitting the revolution back there, Dolores Hurd, one of my favorite elders. And she reminds us to show gratitude for all that we have. Our elders can offer us the gift of having walked this path ahead of us. It's interesting to me that at this stage in my life, I moved to Oregon from California and I bought a house directly across from Mary S. Young Park, which is a forest. <laughs> For most of my life, I've been a beach bunny. I've loved the beach most of all, but now the forest is calling me. So I wanna offer an invitation to each of us to adopt a perception of eldering as dwelling in the forest of ideas and possibilities. For those of us who are elders, we can ask ourselves, how can I do this next stage well for me? And how can I reframe our society's often condescending views of elders? For the rest of us, we can recognize that elders are survivors. They've made it this long. Some of us have actually thrived and others can draw from our successes and even from our mistakes to add to their own repository of how to live this life. 
Elders have witnessed how life changes over time and we've seen how thankful we can become for things we didn't realize we'd ever be thankful for when we were children. We've seen how relationships with family and friends and neighbors, our community, our country, and this planet can shift and assume new, greater, or in some cases, lesser importance. Here at UCWF, we offer RE programs to teach our children and our youth about our faith. And just as children and youth need age-appropriate spiritual support, so do elders. How about adding programs or even discussion groups to talk about the changing spiritual life of elders? Perhaps we could ask some of our elders to write an ethical will, a letter to someone who will most likely outlive them, not offering money or possessions, but offering what they most want to pass along from their own life experience and faith. As elders, we can offer practical gifts to our community, volunteer to mentor a child, teach a child to play the flute. Some of us will gather in classes as lifelong learners, and then we will bring that information back to our families and our community. And not that you asked, but here's a portion of my personal eldering plan in its current draft form. Uh, I took out most of it because it's a long list and I don't want you to miss lunch. But here's some, here's some of what's on there. First, I always want to have a list of things that I look forward to doing, no matter how simple those pleasures may be. And I want to take the classes that I didn't take when I was in college. I was a poli-sci major. I want to take archaeology and astronomy, maybe even marine biology. I want to continue my path of spiritual learning to help myself make sense of this life I've been given, to continue to ask, why are we here in the first place at this time, and how can I make meaning of all of this? I want to study death and dying. I want to prepare myself to the extent that I can for the end of my life. I'm grateful that our ELM group offers a space to do some of that. I want to return to playing the guitar. I haven't since I was in law school. I want to write. I have a few books in me, I think, and I hope I can get them out. I want to do volunteer work for humans in need. I want to spend as much time as I can with my daughter, Margev, who some of you have now met. I want to have a lot of fun. And I want to be in community with you. May it be so. Blessed be.